So let's take a look at some group policy settings. Now I'm going to start just going off of one of our existing policies. So I'm going to take my default domain policy right here. I'm going to collapse all this other stuff that I don't need at the moment. All right, and from my default domain policy, I can either right click and edit here. And remember, it doesn't exist here, right? This is just a link to it, but I can still edit it from here. Um, I can also, by the way, just as a thought, if I disable the link, it stays linked. It's just not active. It won't actually use it anymore until I re-enable it, which is something great for troubleshooting. Remember to actually exists down here. So here's my default domain policy and I can right click and edit here as well. Also, one other thing I want to show you is this GPO status right here. <clears throat> so it can be enabled, which means all settings from this GPO, this group policy object are enabled, they're applied. Or we can disable user configuration settings, disable computer configuration settings, or disable all settings. And we'll use this when we're troubleshooting. So I think my GPO is creating a problem. Then I can disable some of those settings on my client computer, do a uh, forced update of group policy, see if that fixes my issue or not. If it does, then I know it was a group policy issue. I need to go fix my group policy and reapply it. All right, let's go to edit. Now, here we have computer configuration and user configuration. All right, one thing that we got to cover here real quick, go ahead and expand that out. One thing we got to cover here real quick is you're going to have very similar settings, not identical, but very similar settings in the computer configuration and then the user configuration. Now, the computer configuration policies apply to computers, not users. So they apply to the computer regardless of which user is logged in. And they will be applied when the computer boots up. And then every 90 minutes after that, they'll be reapplied. So they apply to the computer regardless of which user is logged in. A user setting, those apply to the user regardless of which computer they log into. And they are applied at login and then every 90 minutes thereafter. Now, let me take you real quick back to Active Directory users and computers because there's an important thing here that we need to see. And that is... We have OUs, and for some reason I have my advanced view turned on. Let me turn that off. So we have, thank you, RDP. We have our uh, standard settings now. We have our organizational units, and we will have users and groups inside these organizational units. Okay. I also have organizational units for computers. So here my domain controllers one is all of my computers that are domain controllers. Now notice this computer is right here. This is a folder, not an organizational unit. And you can tell the difference by that little icon right there. If it has that little icon right there, that says this is an organizational unit. You can apply a group policy to it. This is a folder, no little icon right there. Therefore, I can't apply a, a group policy to it. All right, so what does this have to do with the user and computer configurations? Let's say that, let me go back to my group policy editor here, and let's say I made a bunch of changes here in the computer configuration, and I applied that to, or I linked that to the West Wing guests. Well, the only thing I have in here is users. So none of my settings are actually going to apply anywhere because I set computer configurations and then I linked it to an OU that only had users in it. If I wanted it to take effect, I wouldn't need to link it to an OU that had actually that actually had computers in it. So when you're thinking about your settings, think about where you want them to apply. Do you want them to apply to the user? Or do you want to apply them, them to the computer? And then you have to link them to an OU that has the appropriate type of object in it, either user or computer objects. Okay, hopefully that's useful. Back to our editing. So I have for users and or for users and computers, I have policies and preferences. Now, the difference between a policy and a preference. A policy is a policy I set that the user can't change. All right, so that is, I set this setting, that is the way it will be. 
A preference is a setting I set that the user can override. So, if I set a setting in preferences that gives, let's say, a folder redirection setting. So, uh, right here, I can set a folder setting. And I can set this folder setting however I want. So, I want to create a new folder and then I can choose properties and what I want this to look like and this will create a new folder for them and that would be great now that is a preference which means they can undo that they don't have to keep it let's look at network shares I can set a specific network share that I want on this particular computer a user can undo that so those are preferences a Policy is something I set that cannot be changed. If somebody tries to change it, they will get an error message saying, this has been set by your administrator, deal with it. All right, that's not quite exactly what it says, but it gets the point across. Okay, um, so let's take a look at policies first. So I have software settings, and this has to do with software installation. <clears throat> so I can set specific software to install, and remember, I'm in the computer area. Under users, we have the same thing. So here if I set a software installation policy then it will apply to the computer so it will uh, be installed on that computer regardless of who um, logs into that computer. If I set it as a user it will install or check for installation whenever the user logs into that computer and if they go to another computer the software will follow them because it's applied to the user not to the computer okay so we have software settings by the way in order for this to work and I'm not gonna go through a whole lot of detail here with all of them but I can set a package to be installed but there are limited types of packages that can be used basically it has to be an MSI or a Microsoft installer package in order for group policies to deliver it if you don't have it in as MSI you're gonna need a solution other than group policy software installations or so software settings under Windows settings I have a name resolution policy I, basically this is all stuff that's specific kind of to Windows this is where we're gonna find our security settings including our account policies our uh, including password policies lockout policies event log policies all right an area that I use a lot and that I find most of my useful configurations in is under administrative templates and this is a fairly large section so I have control panels so these are all of my administrative templates related to the control panel including personalization here are all of my settings regional and language options user accounts and you'll notice some of these have folders with more options underneath them as well I'll also have network settings and a whole bunch of options here in network settings. And we'll take a look at how they're how to manage them here in a minute. Um, we have start menu and taskbar settings. So a lot of the information that we're going to find uh, really useful is going to be under administrative templates. Now, pretty much if you can imagine it, it can be configured using group policies. And a couple of big areas are going to be the system settings and the Windows component settings. And this is going to give you a lot of options for configuring how you want your computers and your network or your users to function and what you want to allow them to have access to and what you don't. So you're never going to memorize everything that's in here it's just not possible there are way too many settings so here's how I approach it when I have a setting I want to be applied odds are I can apply it through group policies now I might not know exactly where it's at and I can fumble around in here for a while and try to figure it out but more often than not your best approach is to google it real quick group policy block access to the control panel something like that and it will take you to that area <clears throat> or tell you how to get to that area all right 
let's take a look at editing some of these. So right here you see a handful of settings and we're just going to walk through a few of them. Let's double click on this one. They're going to be slightly different. Um, different types of policies will be slightly different in the way they look but this should give you a basic idea of how it works. So disable context menus in the start menu. We have three options here, not configured, enabled, disabled. Now this has to do with um, the way group policies are applied. So not configured means this policy doesn't care. If another policy cares, that's fine. Um, this policy does not care. Enabled means I do care and I want this policy active. So in this case, since it's a disable context menu, and this is going to sound weird, if I enable this policy, then it will disable context menus. So not configured means I don't care. Enabled means I do care and I want this policy applied. Disabled means I do care and I don't want this policy applied. So disable context menus, I want that disabled, which means in an ironic twist of fate, the context menus will be enabled. Now, why do we have that? Why do I have uh, an enabled and a disabled option? Okay, it has to do with the way group policies are applied. Group policies are applied in a specific sequence. So you start with a local policy which exists on your local computer, then you'll have the domain policies, and then you'll have all of these organizational unit policies. And if, like in this case, let me come back over here. In this case, let's say I had a user in my guest folder. So they would have their local policy applied from the computer they logged into, then any policies linked to the domain, then any policies linked to West Wing, then any policies linked to guests. Now you can see we can have multiple different layers of policies here. Now, if there is a conflict between those policies, the last one applied wins. So I could say, give me a policy right here at the West Wing that says, disable context menus in the start menu. Yes, enable that. I don't want those context menus working. And then... I, and that would apply to everybody in the West Wing. But let's say I had a group in the West Wing. So I've got four different OUs in this West Wing presenting. We have four different OUs and I have one group of people inside one of those OUs that I don't want that policy to apply to. Well, then I create a policy there and I say disable context menus, disabled. And so what happens is their policy will be applied from the West Wing that says enable this policy and then the more specific one will be applied that says disable this policy. Now if I set that as not configured, what would happen is that group policy at their specific OU would say, yeah, don't care about it. If it's enabled somewhere else, that's fine. If it's disabled somewhere else, that's fine. We don't care. But this allows me, by giving me the don't care, yes I do care, enable the policy, yes I do care, disable the policy, means that I can have different settings based on where you are at inside my organizational unit structure. So amazingly flexible. And you get to see how this can be a little bit confusing sometimes and why that group policy modeling and results wizard is so incredibly helpful. All right, now some settings are gonna have options. So here's a good one. Um, force the start to be either full size or menu size. Here is an option. So let's say I want to enable that and then I can choose which size I want that to be. So not all of my policies are going to have these different options, but some of them will and those options will show up down here. All right, so I go through and, oh, one more thing we need to see is this right here, which tells us a little bit more about this policy. So remove and prevent access to shut down, restart, sleep, and hibernate commands. So this tells me a little bit more about what this does. This right here, supported on, tells me which versions of Windows this is going to apply to. So this is going to apply to at least... Windows 10 or Windows Server 2016. So if I apply this to an OU that has Windows 7 and Windows 8 computers in it, this policy won't apply because it's not applicable to them. Okay, so 
that gives you an idea of how to set some of these options. <clears throat> now, you go through, you make all of the changes you want to your policy, and then you save your policy. Let's do, I'm just going to set one policy here. I want to enable a policy. Now, remember, I am editing, and I actually realized I don't want to save this, because I am editing my uh, default domain policy. Once I've gotten all of my changes done, then I'll save it and I'll close out of my policy. And that will take effect the next time group policies are applied. Now remember, anything that's set in the computer takes place when the computer is powered on and first connects to the network, and then every 90 minutes thereafter. If I need it to update faster, then what I can do is I can go to a command prompt. And I'll just use PowerShell admin here as my command prompt. And I can issue the command GP update, which is group policy update. And the best way to do it is to do a forward slash force, which forces an update of all of our policies immediately. And now I don't have to wait for 90 minutes, or, and I don't even know where I'm at in that 90 minute cycle, right? So it could update a minute from now, it could update an hour and a half from now, I don't know. What this does is this forces it to update right now, and that becomes really useful. Okay, so um, that gives you hopefully a quick overview of how to edit uh, group policy updates. Now in our next video, we're going to take a look in a little more detail at creating and linking group policy objects.